you for having me. And I'm going to sit here. If that's wherever you mm -hmm. is that okay? Mm -hmm. And um, so I felt that in these times that we're in, um, that are going on, right, all around us, and I love your signs, and I love what you guys are doing here at the school. I walk through the studios too, and um, uh, you know, students at Columbia are also very involved as much as can be while they're trying to get their degree at the same time, right? Um, and uh, I think that it's, you know, I thought that uh, instead of showing maybe residential projects, I would show some infrastructural projects. So projects that are within the public realm. So for infrastructural projects that are in the public realm. And so Nadir, um, <laughs> asked, you know, I have to give a reading, right? What's your reading that you're going to give? I'm sure nobody had time to read it. But so I um, gave this reading, which was Lightness by Italo Calvino. And I'm going to just kind of read a little bit of my introduction here because I want to make sure I hit on some points. But um, so Deanna said, you know, our office. And so I'm going to show these projects as kind of their test ideas and we're using, we've been kind of developing different techniques as everybody does and they've changed significantly over time, obviously, the kind of different techniques that we use in our office or that people are using in the studio. Um, and also, as I said, um, you know, in light of the fact that this is day 68, um, but who's counting, right? Um, this insane chaos of our federal administration um, and that I'm a practicing architect, I wanna show you a little bit of what I practice, right? Because that's what I do, I'm not an academic, so I'm gonna show you what I practice. Um, so. Um, I'm going to go down what I'm calling a kind of slippery slope here um, of using our work, built or otherwise, to address this term lightness. And so, and this, by slippery slope, I mean that uh, given all the complexity of an architectural project, especially a built project, um, it makes it difficult for it to stand as evidence for an idea, I would say. But so my slippery slope will be constructed of a small series of projects, just four projects, which span the you know kind of the length of our project practice to a certain degree, and um, uh, kind of by identifying certain aspects maybe or moments or details, I'll attempt a what I'm calling a consequentialist logical device, use them as a consequentialist logical device, and to make matters worse. Um, as I said, while on this slippery slope, Nadir asked me, you know, and others I assume, to give a simple reading for you in advance of this. So, why lightness? Um, so, um, as you obviously know, um, okay, let's turn the lights down a little bit. Yes. There we go. So, um, I selected Calvino's, and I don't know how to turn them down, but. Okay. You don't have to turn it down too much. No, it's probably, it might be okay to have books. Yeah, just the ones so I can't read, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm okay. So lightness was one of the um, essays, and you may know from reading the introduction or not, that was written by Al uh, Calvino for the Charles Elliott Norton lectures at Harvard. And as you may have read in the introduction, that he never delivered them as he died right before leaving Italy when he was meant to deliver these lectures. And um, the memos, as he called them, are lectures on the value of literature that Calvino felt were important for the coming millennium. Um, and at the time of his death, Calvino had finished all but the last lecture, so consistency, it's a very light, so he hadn't finished that. Um, so he notes in his text that the term lightness varies in usage um, and differentiation from physical weight such as the lightness of balsa wood, but in other words, light like a bird, from light, I, an expression like light like a bird, as Paul Valery, Valerie wrote, and not like a feather. So light like a bird and not like a feather. So lightness is also considered a noun. So I'm gonna use it as a noun. Um, and I'm borrowing from his term in literature as he extends it in the essay through anthropology and ethnology and mythology, and I'd say towards architecture, because he really talks also a lot about things and weights and bodies. Um, so I'm thinking today both about material weight and value for the term lightness. And as this text I'll say is, is um, something that's aspirational and that maybe 
we could think about it, or I might be as presumptuous to think about it as something that might sit, let's say, on a shelf along some of these projects or something as a kind of sitting there alongside, kind of as a reminder of something that's in my head. Um, so I've borrowed this title and I've combined it with uh, the words other infrastructures. And my thought here is that lightness and other infrastructures might sometimes address this material weight and value directly or indirectly. Um, and I'm not going to be consulting my steel manual. This was my steel manual when I was a student here. And it's all tabbed and probably, you know, people here, you know, had them. But, you know, that was, so that's not the kind of lightness I will necessarily um, be referring to. But, um, so, so some questions here. Um, so can lightness, so I'm thinking about lightness in its multiple meanings and to focus, let's say, on a space in a kind of heightened and exaggerated sense. So space in which big and small things move, space where events happen, a space which is full. Um, so can you subtract weight from architecture or from people? So I mean, these are just some images of some projects. These are not necessarily the infrastructure projects, but um, um, can lightness be a value, lightness as a value rather than as a defect? I'm going to leave it up here for a second. Um, so lightness soon, he says, soon reveals its true and unbearable weight. So how thin? So this question of how thin could a support be? This was kind of a question about this house. How thin can a support be? Um, and architects as practitioners, I want to say, because um, ours is, is an art of kind of indirection. And as architects, we obviously don't make buildings, but we're rather, we make this elaborate set of instructions, right, that direct the work of others. We make this elaborate set of instructions that direct the work of others who actually make the building. So, you know, we all think we're making buildings, but we're actually making these very elaborate, um, you know, attempts at getting towards it with the model or the drawings, like trying to get closer and closer. So this is a, a I'm sorry it's blurry, but it's a very intense construction document for a land port of entry on the uh, border of, between Canada and the US. Um, so between our intention and the materialization of a built work, a multitude of institutional mechanisms intervene um, when we're building something, both of finance, of law, of industry, of trade, that inexorably shape and encrust and encumber and threaten to suffocate both the process and the product of our art, of what we're trying to do. <laughs> so these built things are, are like very, a real struggle. Um, and um, I'm going to present, as I said, four infrastructural projects. So I want to just show, um, oops, I'll go here to, um, so this question of how scale can play um, a role in the nature of, of lightness. And um, something weird is, there we go. Um, so. In this case, um, a, a ferry building where a door is something that is kind of extra large, a huge door which extends from exterior to interior um, through movement to expand a very, very small space into something maybe much larger. Um, this is a photograph by Judith Turner that I like because it shows how thin the door is. Like it's incredibly thin, but then when opened, it kind of makes this huge other space. It's very dark. That's the, that's the bed of an aircraft carrier. So I was thinking that, that in keeping the, um, the pier, just clipping the building to the edge um, and keeping the majority of the pier open rather than dropping it in the middle, that it would uh, be like a kind of aircraft carrier of space where, where things happen and change um, through. Um, there's something very weird happening with the slides. Mm -hmm. What do you think it is? Does it look good in, on your computer? Well, my, it's like something in front, and maybe that has to do with it. No, I don't know what it is. But it's just kind of blue. Yesterday we had a problem with this thing. Hmm. If this thing is okay. All this is okay, right? It looks great here. There. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. what it actually looks like. 
<laughs> there you go. Okay, so this very large thing. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Perfect. Okay. I don't know. It's like now it's not advancing, and this thing keeps popping up in front. Okay. Um, so the building makes room for um, expected and even um, unexpected events like this. Um, excessiveness of real occupation here on the site immediately following 9-11 as a piece of urban infrastructure when it was one of the only ways to get in and out of lower Manhattan when all the subways were, if you remember ever seeing that subway map where there was nothing below, I don't know, it was 34th Street or something. So um, this kind of open space that was meant to anticipate. Um, so um, so the, this, um, this space of lightness, so I'm thinking about kind of edges and boundaries and kind of opening up edges and um, these are just some examples of some kind of edge conditions and a corning and a model and in the building of this kind of edge condition between of a kind of lightness that has a space within it and that was 50 30 that's a detail from a handrail um, with a similar kind of space but I want to talk about um, and this is a space of the facade of 53rd Street where we were trying to push out, just a sketch, trying to push out into um, kind of a window that could actually look all the way to the Hudson River from inside. Um, so I want to talk for a minute about this idea of architecture, right? The, that art, I mean, infrastructure and architecture and infrastructure and that um, infrastructure, I would say, is... Um, of course, it's this basic physical organizational structure as a definition of facilities, structures, roads, power supplies, but it's also needed for the operation of a society. So, um, so I'm thinking of these projects that projects that are both maybe for institutions like an educational institution or um, the ports that I'm going to show or an EMS station are, are these kind of pieces that are needed. So I'm extending it to an educational facility, but this is um, a project for OSU and it's their um, uh, student health services building and it's an addition to a student health services building and so I was walking through your studio and seeing all your beautiful models and um, wanted to show you how we're kind of using models in a very direct way to produce something it's like kind of directly from something you might produce at the studio into a building. So we were studying, um, it's an addition to a building that's a precast kind of 70s building. And we wanted to work with the precast material as a way, to, as a kind of context relationship to this existing structure. So these are just different profiles that we made with our little $27 wire cutter um, in the office using the four inch blue foam and the four inch, four inch foam also, um, maybe it was six inch we were using because a little deeper because that was kind of the limit that the form we knew we were gonna use would work with. So we were studying a bunch of profiles. Um, and then, let's see, I don't know, there's like some technical problem here. Um, so here's more of those profiles in the office. And we're kind of looking at kind of why would you use one over the other? And then we sent them to um, the concrete fabricator in Columbus. And um, he just took those, made some mold molds of them. So we can study them to see, look at those profiles, how tight we wanted them, how loose we wanted them. We were looking for a kind of softness and lightness about this kind of wall system on the exterior of this building. Um, these were full scale, they're about that size profiles. They're actually, so on the wall, we're, we're studying them in the wall in the office, we're looking at these profiles and we're actually looking at how we could have just four forms that we could put together by flipping them around and getting kind of a variety of um, different um, techniques, right? Then we kind of study them, start, you know, kind of started tweaking them from the foam model in the drawing. Um, and then they're limited, of course, by what fits on a truck that you can drive down the road and get to a site, right? So these, all of these things become part of your constraints in this very complicated world that I was talking about, right, of building. Um, and then this is, I love this photo because it's so banal looking. <laughs> But so that's the, that's the facade of the building. Um, so, so trying to create this kind of curtain softness on this edge 
um, which is a new entry for this health services building at OSU. Um, so, and I'm going to show these two port projects that are, so a land port of entry. Um, so a land port of entry, and I just spoke at, uh, at, at Columbia, we're counting, we did something for day 64, and I talked about the wall in Mexico. So a, the, a port is not a wall. A port is actually something that is welcoming, <laughs> that is about trade, it's about commerce, it's about ideas, about people crossing, you know, it's, it's open. So these are two projects at the northern border that somehow our little office got, and we did all the construction documents for, and they're huge projects, um, through this design excellence program that they have at the federal government where they decide certain projects they're going to hire, you know, design architects or something, whatever that means. But anyway, they thought we knew something about transportation, I think, because we made a canopy once. Um, so anyway, and maybe from Corning. So we made this little drawing when we were interviewing for the project because we started thinking about the border as not a just a line that you cross. Remember, it's talking about a line and a kind of wall of space, but as something that is perpendicular to that crossing that has a number of things, because it's very intense in terms of this program, a number of things that you cross and come into contact with or that are actually happening from the side of the um, operation side versus when you're just driving through. When you drive through, you're, you know, you're just kind of nervous, right, and thinking, oh, they're going to think I did something wrong. Or, I mean, everybody's always kind of nervous, and then you don't realize that there are all these sensors in the ground, and they know everything about you by the time you get to the booth, and you know, hopefully everything's okay, and you just sail through. So, um, let me go up here. But, so this is, you know, one of these drawings with a million options, like one of these kind of constraint drawings, like what, what do we do? And um, here at Messina, actually, um, this, in this case, um, it crosses, it sits on a reserve, what was a reservation <laughs> for the Aquasazni Native Americans, and they cross all the time because they're, they play lacrosse on one side, they've got a cemetery on one side, and there's a kind of a um, island across the river that they, the, there's a reservation where the lot, lot are living, and so one of the things we were able to accomplish was to actually make the road shorter for them, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> so they're, because they're driving many times a day across this, so this spaghetti actually, we, there were intentions. Um, so at the northern border, one of the things um, that we realized when we went there is that when you're coming, as we're doing, you know, the American side, the U.S. side, so when you're coming from Canada and you're crossing, the facade is always in shadow because you're coming from the north going to the south. So you're always greeted, this is the building that was there, you're always greeted with this facade that's in shadow. And we thought, oh wow, you know, what are we going to do with that? You know, it's always in shadow. And so we started to study how we could bring light, daylight, onto a north facade. Was there some way we could bring light, you know, like from the south onto the north so that you would see, it would be naturally lit, maybe for part of the day anyway. So that was one of the agendas we were looking at. So then here are some of the um, construction documents and then that um, light monitor and then channel glass and facade um, that receive that light. The, uh, a port is also a lot about seeing, right, about seeing from one space across. The sight lines are all very important from interior to exterior. Um, this is a little office that kind of has these ears to steal light from the neighbors so that you get actually more daylight. So all these little things. <laughs> So I don't think the federal government was interested in, or even the port directors were that, you know, I mean, we were just doing architecture kind of over here, but at the same time, we're solving all their problems. So that's kind of another thing I want to say today is that, you know, projects like this, there's actually a lot of room for architecture and without anybody necessarily even knowing, you know, what, that it's happening maybe over here. I mean, I'm calling it, maybe I'm presumptuous in calling it that, but... Um, so here's the facade with the channel glass, and it actually, I just was up in McGill University a couple weeks ago, and they, uh, so the students, I'm showing it to the students, and they cross it a lot, and so they were telling me how the light changes so much on this facade because it's moving, right? You're seeing the, um, 
the light from behind, which is the, um, those lines are actually obviously the lines of the skylight. So it, it changes as it moves through the day. And so um, when I said, I think the reason, one of the reasons we were able to get, like, who knows why you get a project, but we had done um, a canopy for Continental Airlines at LaGuardia Airport. And so at a port, there's a lot of canopies. There's an excessive amount of canopies because there are a lot of transactions that happen outside but have to be weather protected, but then also have to have a very, very high quality of light level at night, right? So that's kind of, okay, that's the constraint you're working with, right? So the canopies, are, I'm just very excited about the canopies. So we, we at the two ports, at one here at um, Champlain, we, were, we tried to make a canopy out of this single surface, just out of steel plate, out of a 5 8 inch thick steel plate uh, that was folded and have it only be that material. This is a canopy we had done at North Carolina um, at the project um, for the outdoor amphitheater. And the column, I'm showing it to you because the columns, because we borrowed these columns from our earlier project for this project. So there's the canopy in the cinema. Um, so here are these similar kinds of columns that are start to be shaped, and here they are being made. They had to be slit. They get slit and slid down on something, um, I mean on their base. And um, we wanted to, to angle them like we did at North Carolina so that there was this sense of movement, that it kind of expressed a sense of movement as you were passing through and weren't just static. Um, and this is the continental canopy, which we had done. And much earlier, and this, this project was, so this is also again for students. So we didn't have a project for a canopy. We were hired by some image consultants, I think they were, for Continental Airlines. And we were supposed to do ticket counters for Continental Airlines, ticket counters, and all the stuff you come in contact with. So we're in this new terminal that's being built, and we realized that, you know, those are not the ticket counters we did, by the way. But the only thing that got built here was the canopy. We realized that they, the agents couldn't even see their computer because the light was coming from the south. It was so bright, they couldn't really see the screen. And they were like, we need something. And we said, you need, oh, we need to make a space here for you. you know? So we kind of got our toe in the door, wiggled it around. You know, we didn't let it slam. And we said, well, we need to do a canopy as part of this image program. And then we had to prove that we, we wanted to make something. We ended up, we were working with Guy Nordenson, a uh, structural engineer, you probably know Guy. And we all got together and decided we wanted to try to use carbon fiber. We wanted to use a material that was incredibly light um, to make this canopy that had never been used architecturally. So then we had to go get a BSA number and all this, and we ended up doing it. But anyway, the point being, these are, there's like 66 of these pieces that march down, um, they just took it down recently, it was up for quite a while, that march down, uh, terminal was Terminal C, I think, and this piece was made by a boat builder, Eric Getz, up, who worked on racing sailboats and shells and things like that. So carbon fiber and Kevlar, so it's very, very thin, it's incredibly strong, and he was really proud that, this is a little infrastructural project, he was very proud that the glass is actually working in compression and tension. That was one of the things he was trying to do. So um, you can actually, he kind of did a chin up on this thing. It's very, very strong. So, so back to the canopy. So here we're trying to now use a single material. Couldn't use carbon fiber because if it's used exterior, like on sailboats, you have to put a lot of paint. It doesn't necessarily last. They don't necessarily have a way of working where it's going to have the way it can last in this kind of weather over time. Um, so we were trying to see how we could think about this origami idea of folding the steel, um, working with um, our engineers, Arup, and you know, working with those folds and the bents and the welds so that we find the profiles that have obviously the least amount of, um, this is this guy right here, trouble going on, like red is trouble right in this drawing. So. Um, here, here are those plates in fabrication. And then they, like the concrete prefab wall, gets brought to the, you know, the width of the thing is determined by how it can get there on the highway again. Um, it gets craned up and um, assembled. At, so that's at Champlain. At Messina, um, we had an opportunity. There's another canopy. So 
we got very involved with this. I got very involved with this idea of trying to make something like how how much how light can it be and how far can I span this cantilever? And and so you don't see a fold. It's a shape, right, that's kind of, and, and it also, by the way, has to serve as a light fixture. So the light's not coming down. I wanted the light, the lights are in the ground, shining up so that the whole canopy serves as this illuminated surface that provides a really nice, even surface for people. You, by the way, you don't want to be in this area because this is called the second inspection. This is where they take your whole car apart, so, you know. Anyway, so here's that canopy, right? So. Um, it's like, you know, flying out there. And then this is what the profile looks like. So we wanted to get the edge as thin as possible, but also, you know, you get your, there's like a little rain, little rain gutter there, right there. But that, you know, you don't, under, you don't ever see that thickness, obviously, but that, and having it span as much as possible. So this is steel. Lori, what is the canceling on that? How long is the canceling yeah. on that? I'm gonna say 30. No, I'm not going to say, there's a guy right there. I'm going to say 24, something like that. 24, I'm going to say. Yeah, maybe center line. So, then back to the facade. And we, so there were, so these are, so I'm kind of ta talking, I'm not really talking about the project and the program so much, but about these techniques that we were trying to achieve in these kind of crazy, intense infrastructural projects. So. There are a series of outbuildings, and I won't go into them all. And now I have to kind of get back here with the mouse somehow to take this thing off of here, but now the mouse has disappeared because I can't advance the slide. Okay. Where is my mouse? Sorry. Do it. It's gone. Is it, did you see it? Oh, there it is. Okay. But I can't, I can't, I'm trying, oh, there it is. Okay. I have to, there's something in front of my image and that's why I can't, there's something wrong with the project. Okay. So this is one of the outbuildings. Um, we, we got this idea, this is a really crazy idea, but I had this idea that I didn't want to have curbs in this building because there are these outbuildings. I didn't want to have all these buildings sitting on curbs, right? These look you know, sitting on curbs, and then you're driving around the curbs, a lot of movement around the cars. I mean, I'll show you some of those drawings. So, so we developed a whole way of eliminating the curbs in the project, which so this is how you architects keep themselves entertained. But I, because I wanted the relationship of the building to be, you know, very clean with the ground and have a kind of permeable surface here. Um, and we convinced them because we said that, oh, the snow plow, you know, this is really going to be a big problem because they have so much snow up there. And the snow plow is going to run into these curbs. It's going to be a big, big problem. So you're much better without curbs. So they let us do it. So it's 88 acre site, by the way. So we and we were working with Michael Beirut at Pentagram, and we wanted to. So we got this idea. I wanted to use yellow as a color that would orient you. So this is a, I don't, you don't want to have a million signs, right? But color could maybe orient you through the site, and we didn't have curbs, so how do you know where you're supposed to walk and not walk, and where the cars go and all that? So we started to develop this idea of yellow as this environmental graphic, or you know, idea of like how to find your way around the site, and if it was yellow, it was kind of where people could walk, and yellow like yield sign yellow, that kind of yellow, that was the yellow we used. So this is, so Sean Gallagher was working in the office I don't know if anybody knows Sean, he's DSR. Anyway, he, this is one of the drawings he made of just the, the yellow, like the world of yellow in the projects. It goes into the building some places and um, kind of unifies everything together. So this is the whole site, and you see some of the yellow and how it becomes this place where you walk, and it comes onto the facade, and right? Um, so here are these fields. So look at no curves. Look at that. So, <laughs> so these sloping fields that are kind of moving the water away also are areas where people can walk because there are a lot of big trucks, a lot of vehicles moving around here. You know, when the architectural photographer is not taking his pictures, like right now, Michael Moran. Um, so here's another example. So yellow, of course, has to be used on these bollards that are you know also everywhere. It's a world of bollards these ports, so you're organizing all the ballers, and then the yellow, so, you know, kind of go in, go to the building where you see the yellow, and the, this is insanity, right? Here it is. Then there's a kind of yellow cork 
behind the um, the desk at the inside, and then you know railings some places, kind of sloping, moving railings that have angles that you know kind of keep people where it gets a little too steep um, near the yellow. Um, and then this is uh, the customs agents are in here. So there are these two outbuildings that they wanted to buy. They wanted to just there the GSA is a weak, well the customs and CBP is the client customs and border They said we can just buy buildings off the shelf. We can buy you know just a kind of building that is just made of you know we can buy from a catalog. We don't really need you to design these two buildings. So then we had to show, prove that we could make these buildings for the same price they could basically do a Butler building, right? So that was kind of our agenda here, to make something very economical, um, but had, we felt, an improved quality of life for the people working in there, i.e. natural light, maybe, as one thing as possible. So you walk across the striped yellow, you go into the yellow wall where there's a box that is where there are offices, and there are also vehicles in here. This is the plan of the building. I just kind of found this recently. But what I wanted to show, so these are offices, but this part of the building is a water tank. Can you read what that says? Can you read it? I don't know. That wall of the building, it's actually the south wall of the building, is a double concrete wall that is both holding up that wall of the building and part of the structure, but contains the um, reserved water system for sprinklering in case of fire, right? Because there are like no fire hydrants around here. So we had to have, so we made this as a kind of, in the building we made a wall, this is the wall that, it's a board finished concrete that actually holds the water. It kind of helps the building stand up because it has the trusses and then it also contains this water. So these are two buildings, the two buildings. So that's the, that customs building. And then this building is a building that is, um, <laughs> I never thought I'd be saying these words. This building is a building that's just for scanning trucks. So that's this building. So here it is, a building that's just for scanning trucks. I get to, I get to design a building for scanning trucks. They wanted to buy a butler building. And, oh no, we can design that building, you know. <laughs> So we wanted to bring, they weren't going to have any natural light. And so what we did was we have this kind of cantilever, right, that lifts up and holds up where, to bring the light in from um, the west. And then also that's, this is the light that supplies daylight for the scanning. And then this light is at the level of a body of a person standing in there because there's a little room where somebody goes into. So this is it. I like this photo of it under construction. So you kind of see how it separates from the wall the steel holds that up, but it's, it's kind of cantilevered and propped, right? So this, that kind of lightness. So here's the building and the yellow. Again, the yellow is where the person goes in when their truck is being scanned. So it's like when you're getting your teeth x-rayed and then the, the technician goes out of the room. Well, <laughs> you sit in there, your truck gets scanned, um, you know, and then everything's okay. But one of the things we were trying to achieve with this building was to see if we could produce a building that looked as if it was floating. Like, could it be so light that it's floating? So the earth burns up to that wall um, that has, this is where somebody's eye level would be inside um, to bring light in, you know, at that level. Um, so, I mean, I think for the most part, the CBP and the Port director, they would have been probably perfectly happy to be in a concrete box as a port building. They would have been perfectly happy to, for the buildings to be a concrete box. So we were constantly trying to um, in, introduce daylight into their lives. Daylight and light materials that we could prove were strong enough that you know somebody wouldn't shoot at them or whatever. So um, in this case, we have a polycarbonate wall that's a very, you know, it's like one inch thick polycarbonate, but it's incredibly strong. And, um, you know, a second wall behind it um, and that allows light, I'll use this one, that allows light in this, this on the skylight, but then we have to show a body there because they don't want, you know, they think they don't want people to see who's in there, and, you know, it's a whole kind of world of that going on. Um, so here's how that polycarbonate wall works. It's actually a truss, right? This is supported uh, vertical truss that 
supports it and at the facade to the north, and this is that northern wall where we wanted at Messina, we also wanted to have light emitting and um, a kind of layering with um, another condition beyond. So here's that condition when you're inside. You don't actually even want to be in here, by the way. But the students at, at McGill told me they did come in here because when you're on a bus, you get kind of shepherded into here off the bus. And, but mo normally, if you're in a car, you never would end up in here. But So there, you, you got to see it anyway. So at the facade, um, we, we were working, again, with this condition of the light, bringing light in from above and also behind. Um, and these layers of the yellow of the United States that are behind the facade of um, looking north. And so the, the final project I want to show is this little project up in the Bronx that is an EMS station, an emergency medical services building for um, a community up near Hunts Point. And uh, the city, this was one of the first ones that was built when well, it was finished a few years, not too many years, like three years ago, I think, but it, two years ago. But um, they instituted a program when they realized that a lot of these neighborhoods don't have hospitals near them. You know, they used to just have an ambulance that would kind of sit there in their neighborhood and then get dispatched, or an EMS truck that would get dispatched. So now this is a place for the EMS workers to be before they get dispatched, right? So it's really some people, it's kind of like a fire station, but they're not cooking mm -hmm. and hanging out as long, but they do long shifts. So really good, really great people. This is a view from a very large housing. Uh, it's, I think it's a HUD, HUD housing project right across the street. So we were concerned about the roof and what you would see, the roof. Um, so we wanted to provide a fifth facade for that community. And um, again, it's just, it's a small building um, and it has a very weird kind of configured site. And these, I suppose, after doing the borders, the ports, you know, we were working with this, these kind of vehicles moving through a site, but it's, it's all about these radiuses and turning radiuses for trucks, and it's, it's kind of crazy, but so we end up with this configuration. And just, again, for you guys, um, so we made a lot of models. This is just, these are just the models stacked up. I just found them the other day back there in the corner. So these are all little models, but we were studying um, the, you know, kind of tweaking, obviously, the roof. These are, this is, in that same photo where the, um, the wall was up, but this is the model of the building, but then these are a variety of these models. We're kind of studying both the, the slope of the roof together with the configuration right, of the building. So they all look really similar, but they're not, but we, we had to keep <laughs> studying it. So this is what's happening on the site. So there's all these vehicles moving through this tiny little thing. And this is the idea that obviously that fifth facade, and we're working with Kate Orff from SCAPE, who's a really great landscape architect, um, on this, and she's really, we are really excited that we actually have a cistern in the corner of the building so that we could water the community garden that's next door. So this is just the idea of a section. It's about moving the air through um, and sun angle and vehicles moving through. So it's a very simple building and um, it's a very rough and ready building. So um, like the equipment bay, the people grab their stuff, they go down to the trucks, they open up. The doors, um, but it's a little building that we felt um, was trying to be bigger than it is. So the truss, you know, that provides this cantilever at the corner um, to kind of this lightness of the upper level and a kind of like muscularness of this uh, exposed steel that's on the inside. And also the, um, I think I have another view of the, you know, just, I mean, you kind of work with what you've got, right? So we, we're exposing all the, mechanisms that's behind this, right, up in here, just to give more height to this space, right, to give a little air, a little lightness to it. Um, and then there's two different facades. Part of it is operable, and then as, as it goes further down, there's like a gym where they can work out uh, down here, actually. So that was the image that's on the poster, right? So I just wanted <clears throat> to say that I feel that lightness um, for me goes with, as in the Calvino uh, essay, with precision and determination, not with vagueness and the haphazard. Um, he, and so he mentions it, and so I feel sympathetic to that. So my question of this, um, what I was calling this slippery slope, right, in which um, 
you know, a party, like somebody asserts that some, you know, that a relatively small first step leads to a chain or some kind of related events of a slope sliding all the way to the bottom, right? So the strength of such an argument, of course, depends on the warrant, i.e. of whether or not one can demonstrate a process that leads to a significant effect and the, mistake, and the mistaken belief um, in the sense of the slippery slope in that it ignores uh, the possibility of a middle ground maybe and assumes a discrete or kind of direct trans transaction, transition from A to B, from lightness to this, like pointing like this is lightness. Of course, that's all very, you know, slippery slope, I would say. But um, anyway, that's what I've attempted to do here. And so the first project I built when I left Cooper Union was this megaphone. And it was for, this is just my, like, field notes at the end. Um, and uh, it was built on the Battery Park City landfill while they were building Battery Park City so for creative time. So I did it with an artist and a uh, performance artist, John Malpete and Erica Rothenberg. And there were a series of, you know, temporary artworks on this that creative time organized. And the project was called Freedom, is called Freedom of Expression National Monument. And it has a plaque at the base of it. There's a bronze, pa I didn't want bronze, but Erica, who I collaborated with, wanted to be a bronze plaque. So it's bronze. And it says, um, you know, this is Freedom of Expression National Monument, and you're invited to step up and speak out. And it was pointed at the World Trade Center, the financial district and the World Trade Center. When you look through that hole, that's what you saw. And people would go up there and they'd shout about how they hated their boss and all kinds of things. It's very funny. But um, so later, mm -hmm. when Freedom, when um, Creative Time was organizing a, uh, some exhibits, when the, when the Republican National Convention was in New York, they wanted to resuscitate the piece. So we rebuilt the piece. And then they're like, where should we put it? And we said, well, we should put it in Foley Square where the courthouses are. And we'll point it at the courthouses. So we did. And then when we rebuilt it, we had to put um, like handicap um, railings around it. And ramp has handicap on it. But, um, and now there's a show that's being assembled at the Museum of the City of New York for I think 50 years of celebrating 50 years of public art, where they're going to um, reenact it um, on a terrace of the building. So it's kind of funny how something like this little thing kind of has a life of its own, this little, very light little piece that I was very proud to be a part of. Thank you. <laughs> the uh, Apple default. On my new computer. Yeah. So anyway, I know we have a reception, right? I don't know if we. Anybody has questions? any questions? Should take advantage of this intimate setting. Or not? That's fine. Yeah. So it's uh, in talking about the works of infrastructure that you did. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of got into that work by accident, right? And I'm not entirely, well, but yeah. it wasn't your. I, yeah, I mean, I can say something about that. Yeah. I mean, I don't see that much of a difference when you know when you're working on a pro. I mean, like so. I just want to say something about like that we fell into the work. So we at a certain point because we started like a lot of like you guys are going to go out and maybe try to start an office. I don't know at some point. You know, we were doing lofts, like lofts. The the you know the freedom of expression. You know these little pieces. And then at a certain point, and we never got to do a footing even. We got so excited when we got to actually put a footing in the ground and do a building that had a footing. But um, we were doing a lot of residential work and I just wanted to do public work. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted to do work in the public realm. Mm -hmm. And we got, the ferry building was a really important project for us. So that was really, for me, it was very important because I felt like I finally got, it's like you get to get back to the city, you know? You get to feel like you get to contribute, actually, because private work is private work for private people. And even though, um, so in the case of 53rd Street, it's an urban project, so you're contributing to the urban fabric, but everything inside, I, like I can't take you there, you know? 
I can't go in somebody's unit and poke around. So, uh, but the, I mean, I don't, when you're working, I don't see the work that different. It's, you, you know, it's just the client is extremely different. It's like a multi-headed client. I mean, you can't believe these meetings, you know, with like, I always call them the $10,000 meeting. They're probably more than that. But, you know, like all the people that come to the meeting and sit around the table and just because that's their job to sit there at the table. Don't you love that? Huh? I just love those meetings. I love those meetings. I love the meetings where, well, I like the meetings. That, I don't like those meetings as much as I like the meetings with the engineers. I really like meeting with, you know, mechanical engineers and the structural engineers and the team. I, that, I love those meetings because that's where you're really collaborating on a project. You're sitting and you're thinking about a project. You know, you're working things out, and that's really where a lot of design happens. Actually, you don't do it by yourself in a corner. You know, you're sitting and working. You know, talking to people. So, um, but I don't. The difference is the client. You know, it's just that's what's. And maybe we got to do more architecture. We got to test more things because. You know, they were. I mean, I could present that, and Tom Maine says the same thing about his port projects and his federal courthouses. Is that you're, you never really talk about the architecture with them. <laughs> you, or necessarily all these, you might talk about daylight, but you're sol you're like, you've got your matrix, you're solving the problems, you know, I'm solving the problems here. So, which is fine. Don't you think they know the difference? <laughs> My experience of course. in public projects when you meet with community people, when you have to present options, they know right away which is a good one. It's amazing. They like you give them three and you know this. Yeah, is the no, one people really want. no, I'm not saying people aren't smart. They, people are very the smart, of course. The community is, is very smart. But they 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 get it. They may not know. Right. No, but their interest the reason is. I'm saying that is that they their concern is safety and security. You know, they've got their whole you know, blinders on for their agenda, which they have to do, of course, because I, I don't know that. I'm not the expert of that. So I would call your lecture weight. Oh, you'd right. call it weight? <laughs> <laughs> it's because the opposite of weight. The, the weight, the power of gates and doors, mm -hmm. is the power of history mm -hmm. and the power of culture, mm -hmm. the history of culture and humanity. Mm -hmm. Those are doors and gates. Right, so thresholds. Yeah, of thresholds. Course. But, yeah. but that's the yeah. between nature and culture, inside <clears throat> outside, public private. Mm -hmm individual collective, etc., mm -hmm. etc., And then you end with a way, what's more, way, what has more weight than the word? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what Bucky Fuller ends, says, you know, how much so is your building weight, right? I so I was thinking, weight, not lightness. I right, think but I'm thinking also about, things I'm thinking about an economy, the, though, of means, too. What I'm saying is that <laughs> a wall may be heavy with bricks, mm -hmm. but it has no weight. Yeah. Or gravity. No, gravity. We're maybe. talking yeah. about gravity. Not gravity. Wait, okay. So <laughs> just just throw the provocation okay. here. Okay. <laughs> I, I would agree. I, th I think your point that it's really the architect's responsibility to bring the architecture to the project mm -hmm. is really important. And that mm -hmm. any project, no matter how small, how big, how how much an object, how much a site or even an activity mm -hmm. that it's it really is our the ta or what we bring to that big table that great big ten thousand dollar table is the architecture the, deli and, and the delight the delight yeah, and we could not, we should not necessarily expect others to understand that arena of expertise yeah. automatically you know they all have their own mm -hmm. uh, areas of expertise so I think you know I think you're your lessons are, are fantastically realized. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we bring in there is to constantly uh, return the conversation in how we approach honoring those concerns that the clients have is through architecture. We bring the architecture in. Um, I, I think I, there's one more thing that from, the, from the, you, what you showed that you didn't talk about. For instance, you have that uh, side view of the building with what is it, corrugated metal? Oh, with the window, top. yeah. Um, and that window. The and window. That window is a great detail. It's a... The way it's sit in, right? But you didn't talk about it. I didn't talk about it. No, it's, it's the horizon but kind of... But the very particular it's like ripped. detail yeah. to have right. that vertical, right? The mm -hmm. frame mm -hmm. set in there. 
Well, they don't sit together very easily. I know they don't. <laughs> That's why I like corrugated, that detail. A corrugated it material and a frame. I know, but it's in so, every several detail. Right. You know, there's, right. And I noticed there's a lot, and some of it went really fast in mm -hmm. the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, there's, there's a lot of detail in achieving mm -hmm. some of those broad gestures mm -hmm. that you talked about no. when you were, I'm saying there's a lot more than just, you know, I was being reductive. the main gestures mm -hmm. yeah. of the organization of the space mm -hmm. and their great use of materials and the light. So you did a lot, you, you talked about the way you carried that light, which was brilliant, mm -hmm. you know, to get the light through, etc. on the north side. Well, but I was I trying to be thematic with the essay, because mm -hmm. I had an assignment. <laughs> yeah. No, Your dean gave me an assignment. I'm saying there's a lot of, um, I noticed that there's a lot of very interesting details at the different scale. Yeah, too, thank you. That probably allow that right. to have the life it has. Yeah. Well, I'm saying this for students, to understand. Right, right. Because when I, I mean, was a student, I loved me seat and said, how do you think a detail like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like AID, how do you get to think that detail? Until you have a question that you yeah. want to solve. Right. And I always say, here you're designing your detail. And this one point well, you out always that the draw, detail yeah. is not just God is in the details. Mm -hmm. The details would allow this to be what it end up being rather than just, you know, sketch. So well I always think you draw something or you make it because you don't know. You don't draw because you know. You make the drawing because you don't know. And you're wondering, right, exactly. how is this going to, because you start drawing like that was the thing about the light. Like, how the mm -hmm. hell can we get the light over here, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're just thinking with your pencil. But you had a question, yeah. I was thinking about how you studied um, in Berkeley, California, right? Yeah, I and, did. And also in downtown, University of California. And also in downtown New York, which are both kind of like places associated with countercultures. Which is the way I, I see some of your work that you're you're able to get these jobs at like or these um, you get the job at these ports or these quarters mm -hmm. and you're sort of like freeing them up a little bit and making them more holistic places and making better light and um, and that those are like really political like high security places like yeah especially right now. everything's political <laughs> and it, and you're also involved in these like public sculpture kind of things that mm -hmm. that could be considered radical or in, I'm just wondering like at what point would will you like could doing a public sculpture hurt your ability to get these um, these jobs in these kind of like political spaces and would you give up one for the other or vice versa like well I did that piece a long time ago I mean I do architecture <laughs> or you, I, that, I, mean, I said that's what I was saying is like my art is art you know it's art and architect it's my art but um, so um, you see you're saying would one threaten the other or something would one I don't know I would hope not yeah I mean just speaking out one would hope that wouldn't right one just speaking out but um, I mean it's funny you know, like being on this public design commission, I'm on this thing in the city here where we look at all the work, because I'm really very committed to public space and the public realm. Um, and you have to go through a, F, like a 88 page investigation that's something that two people in this country never did and they hold, federal, they hold office, the president, the vice president. So I had to go through the D, you know, this DIY, this huge, fingerprinting everything to serve on this commission. <laughs> and I guess I was very boring, so they let me serve on it. But it's interesting that um, we have a president who didn't have to go through something, didn't have to show his taxes, didn't have to, you know, so. Um, no, I'm not afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not afraid. I wouldn't be afraid. I mean, but I don't, I mean, I don't know exactly how to answer your question, but I would think that one would not. But, I, but the, the other thing I wanted to say about the border stations, I was on a jury at GSD, and I think it was Julie Snow who had done a really beautiful border port in um, 
like Minnesota at a wood, very beautiful small port of entry there. And so she was doing it as a studio project and she had some of these people from the GSA who were our clients, representatives, come to s sit on it. And they said the most remarkable thing, I'll never forget, he's Delgado, Vincent Delgado said, um, you know, these buildings someday we might not even need them. This building might be something else, like it could be a cultural space or something like that. And I just thought, oh my God, you know, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> if we didn't need this kind of, it's really like a police building. It's really a police station at the border. Um, but if you didn't need those, and so making it to think about the quality of life and the quality of being in a space, but not trying to be in like a police state mind when you're making mm -hmm. the, the building, so. And, and who said that? What was his title on job? He was, um, I don't, he was, he was one of the client representative working on ports. He was a, he worked for the GSA. But he wasn't Casey Jones. He wasn't in charge of design excellence. He's an architect. He ended up, he's now at Cornell, uh, head of facilities, running their building program there when he I left. Think what is interesting is that there used to be all those there are design excellence programs once upon a time. They're still there. Yeah. And uh, there's some are. They're doing courthouses. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're courthouses. Courthouses. Um, yeah, I'd love to do a courthouse. Courthouses. We had one, but it dropped out of the site. Yeah. yeah. But I think that um, where you have, I think they're fair programs, because it's a lot of those programs fell together with political change. Mm -hmm. You know, so some might have survived, yeah. but others disappeared. Right. Well, they're, now they're building a lot of embassies. Yeah. yeah. Well, the State Department's building a lot of embassies, and they've hired very good architects. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. going to be interesting to see, because embassies are also like, you know, walls, walled buildings. I'm saying these answer to Boston. After all, these are federal programs. They're not trying to be radical or anything. They're trying to, the some people recognize well, the because of, that, of the quality yeah. of what is put there. Civic in the architecture, the right. And because of the design excellence program, this yeah, program exactly. that, then the city has that program too. And that's how yeah. the EMS station, how we got to do the city, never hired design architects to do anything. And then they, David Burney started, he kind of modeled it yeah, after we the federal the government. Yeah. So anyway, this is for all you guys when you go out of here, so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can take that, I think you can take me safe that take that art commission <laughs> and not worry that down the road. Take don't the art commission, don't no, worry I mean, about I it. Think, I think, Lori, the kind of remarkable thing about your trajectory is, and to remember, is the scale at which one starts a practice. It's mm -hmm. small. Very small. It's small. It's still small. And, and it, it's, it, it is both small and it kind of feeds into cultural opportunities that are available at the time. So back in the 80s, it was Creative Time and Art on the Beach. Now it's Socrates Sculpture Park. Now it's TS1. the Governor's Island Follies Project, mm -hmm. which one of our grads in Colorado just, just won. Like, but, if yeah. Richard Serra had be gone to become an architect, do you think that his history with something like Tilted Art would allow him to get like port and border jobs and the and GSA jobs. have they still have that piece? It's like mothballed in New Jersey. I remember one of them. These people say to me, "Where we could put this sculpture? You won't be allowed to go anywhere except site specific, right? This closet." No, I mean, yeah. I would say the bigger question is, does, did he have the temperament to be an artist? Maybe not. Frankly, Sarah, ask your question. Has collaborated with his speed racing project. Although he decided to have the same as Richard Sarah after deciding what he was going to do with And he shows that Richard Sarah had no idea. So, if you're working in the public realm, you have different In last small time, it's a sit there, it's a community, it has a lot of Stuff, a lot of burdens on it, right? But they're all good burdens. They're good burdens. Thank you guys.